Hello there. I'm Father Edna Donnelly from the Father Edna Donnelly Good News Fund. How you doing? It's supposed to have rain tomorrow, a lot of rain. So let's pray, pray that the rain passes by. But today, I'm looking for a guest. So I'm looking for you to be my guest. So if you have a pencil, write down 860-321-7405. 321-860-321-7405. Okay, the first person that calls me, I'll take you out to dinner. The first one that calls me. I'll take you out to dinner before Jesus returns. You know, you get a lot of bad news. Uh, and my foundation is called the Father Donnelly Good News Fund. So I'm just thinking of some of the bad news. Wait, today I read about that Mr. Epstein supposedly committed suicide or the guards were falling asleep and they weren't covering him or whatever. We'll never know the real cause of his death. And that's bad news. Then I just uh, turned on the uh, radio uh, in a car. I heard by two, there were four accidents. Two people got killed by a car accident. One lady went over the hill. And then two people got killed by uh, motorcycles. So you look at that, and that's uh, bad news. And uh, the other, other story about the uh, children who were burned to death in a uh, preschool uh, situation. So it seems when you turn on the TV or you turn on radio, all you have is bad news. Well, I wanted to, to give you a story of some good news. And uh, I'm Father Nadani, by the way, of the Good News Fund. And uh, I was working in Bristol. I was helping out at St. Stanislaus Church. And uh, I decided to take a walk. I was tired of, tired of eating peanut butter crackers. So I said, oh, I'm going to go down to West Street there, and there's a pizza place. So I took a walk, and I walked about two and a half miles. And then I said, well, it's time to get something to eat. So I start walking towards the pizza place, and suddenly it's raining and raining, as they say, cats and dogs. And I just had an operation on my ear, so I was trying to cover it with some, a handkerchief. And it was like as if I was in a shower the way it was coming down. And I was probably about a, a, a half a mile away from my destination, St. Stanislaus Rectory. And it was coming down. Then as I was walking up, holding on to both my ears, afraid that I'd get them wet because I just had an operation. And all of a sudden, a black woman appeared right in front of me with an umbrella. And I said, where the heck did she come from? And I looked at her, and she says, take the umbrella. I said, well, I'll give it back to you. And she said, no, you can keep it. So I had the umbrella. And I was protected, and I turned around, and she was gone. So my question is, do you believe in angels? Or is that, could it be a figment of my imagination? I was holding on to an umbrella. In fact, I took the umbrella back with me, I put it in my car, and I took it home with me, and I'm going to keep it. But was that an angel, or was that somebody just passing by? Most people were worried about the rain coming down, so they're just putting their eyes on the road. Uh, but she came up and she saved me from really getting hurt in my ears. So my question to you, do you believe in angels or not? Give me a call, 860-321-7405. 860-321-7405. Now this is another, that was my personal story. I'll tell you a story about two college kids out in the Midwest, and they're coming home for Christmas holiday, and they were, in a, they were caught in a terrible snowstorm, and their car conked out right in the middle of nowhere, and they're sitting in the car, and the snow was coming down. Then all of a sudden, a tow truck appeared out of nowhere, and they, uh, the tow truck got them, took them in, into the nearest town where they're able to call uh, and get help. And they came out to uh, thank the uh, driver, but the tro truck was gone, and there were no tire tracks in indicating that he had gone. 
So the question is, do we believe in the afternight? Do you believe in angels? Do you believe in a devil? Now, how much do you believe in the after afterlife? Is it all over? I just had somebody who was cremated, and uh, you put the ashes in the ground. It's cheaper that way. You don't have to get a coffin. You don't have to get a lot of ground. And get things quickly done. For nine ninety five, the, the billboards next to mine says nine ninety five for cremation. Uh, is it all over? Uh, do you believe in an afterlife? Uh, do you believe in a devil? Or do you believe just what exists? It, what exists? Is there an afterlife for you? And I've told you the story of many times of the presence of the devil. And I told you the story about Windsor, the couple, a couple in Windsor whose house, I don't know if the house is possessed or whether the individual is possessed or both of them are possessed. I can't tell. But I know I had a group of people going over the house and praying outside of the house. And um, all of a sudden, the window opened up and the women started throwing crosses at those people and yelling and swearing at the people who were praying outside the house. Uh, he tells me there's a knife in his pillow and a terrible sound at night. He gets hit in the back of his neck. She gets slapped on her face. They have a very heavy, heavy um, safe, and it's floating all over the place. Uh, they get knocked off the, their bed, and the bed goes all over the place. And their uh, monitors on the computer is broken nine, nine or 10 times, and the mouse is broken. I've said mass there. I've said the rosary there. I've blessed the house. I saw a car that had $8,000 of dented damage and never left the garage. So because you don't believe in the devil, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, some people don't believe Trump is the president either, but I'm sorry, he does exist. Whether you're happy or not, but he does exist. And whether you agree or not that we have a crisis, a financial crisis with China, or we have a threat of war from North Korea, China, and uh, Russia, now, you may not believe that, uh, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And the economic war and the so-called uh, ballistic war that could occur, he's still, uh, the North Korea is still doing war, uh, tri trials on, on ballistic missiles. So my question is, do you believe in an afterlife, or is it all over after your life has ended? Or is your life, your death, a graduation, or is it the end of your life? So give me a call if you have a, your humble opinion, 860-321-7405, 860-321-7405. And let me know how you feel about the afterlife. And what headline in, in the newspaper uh, touches you the most? I know that there's a big story about the Epstein uh, suicide, so-called. But did you know there are 985 refugees are, who uh, have crossed the border are in the United States? And what do we do with those almost a million refugees or immigrants, whichever you want to call them? Uh, what do you do with them? And then I, I want to know, uh, what do you do with the problem of guns? We're talking about gun control. I'm more interested in family control. I, I, as I've spoken before, I was talking to a prosecutor, and he was telling me, he, for 20 years, he says, come, people have come in with gun problems, arrested because of guns. 95% of those guns are illegal. They got them stolen or bought on the black market. He says, so it's really not a matter of gun control, uh, even those automatic uh, weapons. With a revolver, you could do something with that and shoot not more than one shot. Uh, what do you think about gun control? I say family control. I have two examples. I had a 12- and a 13-year-old boy in Naugatuck when I was a pastor there. Uh, they were playing around with his father's gun. And the father happened to be a policeman. And the belt pulled around with the gun and shot his best friend. Uh, that was a legal gun. It wasn't a stolen gun. It was a legal gun. Another one, 
when I was in another parish not far from here, two bro brothers were uh, fooling around with a gun, and uh, one shot the other, and the other younger, younger brother died. I don't know if that was a legal gun or an illegal gun. I think it was. But most of our deaths come from illegal guns or stolen guns or black market guns, according to the prosecu prosecutor. So when you talk about the gun control, we really need to talk about family control. I'll give you another example. The prosecutor told me that he had a 15-year-old kid who came in with a stolen gun. In the middle of the night, they called him. About 3 o'clock in the morning, they caught him. So the parents come running in, oh, we love you, we love you. Well, if they loved the boy, what was he doing at 3 o'clock in the morning roaming the streets with a gun? So I'd like to have your point. We're all talking about gun control, but we're not talking about uh, family control. And the other thing, what connection is there between these mass killings and guys being high on drugs? Has there ever been a real study about these mass killers? They all say they're nuts. Are they really nuts? They're very angry. But during the time that they do their mass killing, are they high on something? Are they high on marijuana, crack, heroin, fentanyl, fentanyl? What do you think? My humble opinion is because we have so much, so many more mass killings now, and like one in, uh, in Walmart, and then another one in Walmart. How many of those killers are high on drugs before they come in and start their killing? Why is there so many more mass killings now uh, than there ever been before? And one of the reasons is the rise of drugs among young people, about all people. Now, I was talking to one fellow. He's been on marijuana since he was uh, 16. And now he's 30, and his brain's been uh, affected, and he's got he's schizophrenic. And uh, now we're legalizing it. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I had a wedding recently. And... Uh, the girl, after confession, I said to her, oh, when, uh, how long have you been living together? And she said, six years. I said, can I give you some special, uh, spiritual advice? She said, yeah. Tell them to shape up or ship out. And she went up, to, out, went home and said, the father says, you better ship, shape up or ship out of our relationship. Well, a couple months later, they got engaged. And they called me, and because I made that uh, statement to her, she said, would you celebrate the marriage? And I said, okay, I will. So I had the wedding, it was nice, and I renewed all the marriage vows at the end, and people like that, where I tell them, just like this is the first day of the rest of their marriage, the couple just got married, why don't we have uh, a marriage renewal, and all of you people that are married, let this be the first day of the rest of your marriage. And uh, when they do that, they love that. After the wedding, they come up, Father, it's the best wedding I've ever gone to. I said, why? Because of the marriage renewal. Some were married a year, some married five years, 20, 30, 40 years. I had couples married 50 years and even more that renewed their marriage vows. So I, I had the wedding and we had the marriage vows renewed. And then I went to the reception. And the reception was nice. In fact, I went to two of them. I went to one yesterday. Uh, today's what? Monday? No, I went to one Saturday. And uh, so I went to reception, and all of a sudden, all the guys disappeared. And uh, where were they? And they're all cuddled behind some wall, smoking marijuana. Even though it's illegal, you can get marijuana faster than you get cigarettes now, or peanut butter. And I was so disappointed that they couldn't, go, they could not have fun at a reception with music and dancing and wonderful food and friends and end up going like cattle into a corner behind a big fence and smoke marijuana. Uh, I know I tell people, please don't drink or smoke marijuana before the ceremony because I found guys who are high before the marriage ceremony. Not only the uh, best man and the ushers, but sometimes the groom. 
Yeah, things have changed. Okay, I'm Father Edna Donnelly from the Father Edna Donnelly Good News Fund. And if you'd like to call me on any question, just call me at 860-321-7405. 860-321-7405. And I'll drink on that. I was over in Bristol taking care of my car and having serviced because I have a wedding in my, um, uh, Maine uh, next week or the week after. And uh, a lady called me and she told me that uh, she's possessed by the devil. And I said, where are you? She said, I live in Bristol. I said, well, I'll meet you over at Panera's Bread on Route 6 or 16 opposite not too far from Stevens Toyota. So I went there and we sat down and she's unpossessed. And my only question was, when did you start on marijuana? She's 16. I said, you're still doing it? And she said, well, I'm trying to get off it because I'm looking, I'm trying to get a job. And she's 30 years old. I said, how long does it take for that a marijuana to get out of you? She said, for a month. And on my second week, and how do you know? She said, well, I take a test dollar store, there's a way you can take a test if you still got uh, junk in, in you. So we talked for a while, and I saw that she's done. She's cooked. Uh, here from 14 to 30, you're talking 16 years of smoking marijuana. That's affected her brain. Now, I, I, she's schizophrenic right now, and she thinks she's possessed. I said, no, you're not possessed. I go to a doctor and tell him how much, how much marijuana you smoked. Now, nobody tells these people. Like the guy from uh, West, West Haven, uh, he called me, and he, he played for uh, New Haven's baseball team. And we talked, and he, was, he started marijuana at 16, and now he's 20, and he's still high. And I said, don't you realize it's going to affect your brain, your memory, your IQ, uh, your moral part of your brain? Uh, most people don't realize how addicted you can become, and then you graduate to other things. Like when I hear confessions in uh, uh, Walker, I'll be going there Wednesday. When I go to Walker Prison or at McDougal Prison or the New Haven Prison, 18 out of 19 began smoking marijuana, and then they graduated to heroin or crack or something else. And those at Walker tell me, all know somebody who overdosed from drugs and died, and they smoked marijuana. But uh, why is it that we don't uh, take it seriously? Just like the e-cigarettes that you're, you're now has become very popular. And what it does to the brain of the kids and helps them get addicted to uh, cigarettes, and e even worse, that it's an addictive way to go, go to further, but yet we don't uh, talk about it. Uh, why is it that we f look for pleasure but not joy? Give me a call at 860 321-7405. Uh, my question is, what's your question? What's your comment on, on drugs? What's your comment on, on uh, guns, the guns law? What's your comment on Epstein? Uh, what's your comment on the 985 immigrants or refugees that are in the country right now? Uh, we're talking about getting a green card, according to Trump today. Uh, what, what are some of the front page stories? or that the Yankees beat the Oreos this afternoon, I noticed, uh, when I was coming in. Uh, are you a Red Sox fan? Do you have to wear black in the morning that they're over 16 games behind the Yankees? I got a $100 bet that the uh, Red Sox are going to end up uh, ahead of the Yankees. Well, I'm beginning to s save my dollars because I think the Yankees, ooh, I'm a Yankee fan, are really going to they're going to be in front of the Red Sox. They're not going to win a World Series. They don't have the, p the pitching, but they've got some hitters. But I know as a judge is uh, judged out. They even take him out. He can't, he's not doing very well. So if you have a comment on sports, on drugs, on uh, a marriage, I've I got a couple other things I want to talk about. But I'm giving you the t chance. Call me at 860-321-7405. Oh, 860-321-7405. I, I, I sang Mass today in uh, 
Meriden, and after Mass, I was talking to a woman, and uh, she had a phenomenal, not theory, but facts, that when a woman's on the pill, she says, I'm trying to get her on the, uh, on, on the air, but she's in church right now. I, I checked her before I, I started the program. And this is a fact. This isn't a theory. That when a, a woman's on a pill, she feels as if she was pregnant. And she's looking for a protector, a brother Im, uh, image, uh, but to protect her. When she gets off the pill, her attraction to her husband, like I just read in a paper yesterday, I've got three children. I don't love my husband anymore. What happens, uh, there isn't that uh, normal attraction to each other after the pill, and you start being attracted to something else or someone else, some uh, uh, father figure or brother figure or something like that. And uh, I couldn't help reading and smiling when the lady says, I've got three kids, and I, uh, I don't love my husband anymore, and I wonder why. There is a connection between uh, being attracted to the opposite sex, uh, opposite attraction, which are genes, and with the pill ending up being attracted to, not to your husband, but to a father figure or a brother figure. And also from the pill comes a tremendous weakening of the immune system. Why are kids all hung up on peanut butter and all the other, all the problems that they have? The immune system is a lesson. And also we see that girls are having their period much younger, and all we're doing is advertising on television for erectile disorders. So the male's power is lessening while the girl's starting early and the men's less. And I've never seen so many advertisements. Now, every third uh, advertisement is on an ED. I call it e e eternal damnation, but they call it erectile dysfunction. So uh, there is a connection, and I ho hope I can, the lady calls me before the show, but she's out in church, and I don't know if she'll be back. But I had a wonderful conversation with her, and uh, talking about what naturally attracts you to a woman, even the smell. Uh, and uh, complimenting your attraction. Uh, but with the uh, pill, you don't complement your attraction to each other. It goes in another direction. And why is it that so many people are breaking up? The other question is, I had a, I had a wedding uh, Saturday, and they were, married, they were teenage friends from 15. So they're 15 years old, now they're 31. They never went out with anyone else except each other. Now, it's normal, if you're hooked on somebody as a teenager, that means you don't have any freedom. You go through your young adult life uh, attracted, uh, uh, hooked onto someone, and you're very faithful to that person. And uh, so you go from 15 to 30, and with one person, and then you never go through that element of being independent and free. That's normal when you're a young adult. You want to do your own thing. You cut your cord from your mother and father. You want to be independent and all that. But you end up uh, going steady from 15 or 14 and 30, and you've really been tied down, and yet you have a natural need to be free. I remember talking to a woman with three kids, and I went out to lunch with her, and he said, I said, what would you like? Most of all, what would you like? She says, Father, I'd like to be free. She never went through her young adult stage because she was steady with her boyfriend from high school, married him, had three kids, and never was free. And that's one of the, besides the pill as a cause of divorce, going steady just one person. I remember a lady at Mass, she was kind of chubby. Then I started noticing that she's, uh, losing a lot of weight, and she become pr prettier. And she was pretty as it was. And I says, well, they got a marriage problem, and she sh she's, she's involved with somebody else. And she had three kids. And she took off and uh, left the three kids for the man because she wanted to be free. Again, once you go steady as a teenager, and that's the only one you have all through that uh, young adult, your 20s, your teens and 20s, and you end up in 30s. Uh, why is it so many people like to whoop the front page? Not front. Dear Abby said, I've got three uh, children. 
but I don't love my husband anymore. He's a nice guy. He's a wonderful provider. He's a good, uh, a good, good father, but I don't love him anymore. There's a song, I don't love you anymore. But there's a connection between the pill, getting off the pill, and also a connection of going steady from high school all the way through. You agree or disagree? Now, that's my humble opinion. And I've been wrong twice in my life. I think when I was about three years old, I picked up the wrong glass of milk. 860-321-7405. 860-321-7405. Give me a call. And any topic you'd like to talk about, guns, uh, refugees, uh, uh, marriage, uh, whatever you feel is important. Or you have a question you always want to ask a priest, we're afraid to ask. And if you had, uh, here's your chance. If you just tuned in, my name is Father Edna Donnelly from the Father Edna Donnelly Good News Fund. And you probably saw my name on the billboards. And I get a lot of calls from my billboards. Every day I get calls for one thing or the other. One person called uh, recently, and they wanted to uh, get married in the, in the Catholic Church. They Father, would you marry me? And I said, you're not my type. So... Eventually, I did, did marry them or witnessed the, the marriage. They wanted to get married on New Year's Eve because they wanted to bring the New Year's in. But they're living together for six years. Why? What is I? But the law of the diocese, you don't get married on, on Sunday because a lot of the masses. Like last Sunday, I had three masses, and I had a baptism. And I was, I was really tired from... Uh, 7 o'clock until almost 2 o'clock on your feet and saying it's preaching and all that. So that's why they say don't have it on a Sunday, have it some other time. So I went to the bishop. I said, Bishop, would you rather have 300 people on the beach or would you have 300 people on, uh, in church? So he gave me permission. The law of the church is you don't get married on Sunday. You can see why. All the, all the masses that the priest has. And he'll be... But I... Uh, I don't have a parish. So I said, well, uh, I've been help, helping priests, but at that time, I, w I could be free. So I went to one par pastor. I said, could I use your church on New Year's Eve? He said, what are you, crazy? Everybody will get, want to get married on, on uh, uh, a Sunday. I said, how many marriages did you have? He had one. The people don't get married in a Catholic church anymore. They live together or they uh, get married by a JP. I'm going to a wedding in Maine at the end of the month, and they're having a, uh, uh, a minister, not even a minister, a, uh, a celebrant, a secular celebrant. A secular celebrant is one who doesn't mention God in the vows. He just has the vows. There's nothing about God. It's all secular. But the, the father of the groom, I know very well. He said, would you come anyways? So I'll be a token priest there. But the, uh, the fact is, uh, I couldn't get anyone to let me uh, celebrate the Mass. Finally, the fourth church in New Britain at St. Joseph, I was able to uh, celebrate the, the Mass. And they probably spent about $40,000 on the wedding. And uh, between the, uh, the preparation, uh, the Hilton Hotel, the hors d'oeuvres, the liquor that cost between five and $10,000, and uh, also the meal. There weren't 300 people there, about 285 people. So they spent about $40,000, and they gave me that much as an offering. Now, the question is, why did they not give me a, any, any donation? Well, I'm just a functioning person. I don't charge for a sacrament. If you come to confession, I don't charge you. If you make your communion, I don't charge you. If you get confirmed, you're not charged. Uh, so I don't charge, but if you want to make an offering, that's fine. But because I'm just a functionary, I fulfill their... They're much more interested in the reception than they are in the, uh, uh, the celebration of the sacrament of marriage. But that's, that's typical. In fact, another one, I just had another one. That reminds me, I never got anything, anything from that either. And uh, th they're loaded. Again, they put all their money into the reception, and they uh, wanted to keep their mother and father uh, happy so they got married in, in the church. My name is Father Edna Donnelly. Uh, from the Father and the Donnelly Good News Fund. I'll tell you another story about a wedding, then I'll start telling you about the uh, billboards. And then maybe I'll start reading some spiritual things before. But in the meantime, I need a drink.
the, uh, the grandfather came up to me and said, uh, Father, would you celebrate the marriage for my granddaughter? And if I pay for the wedding, then I'll, uh, they'll get married in a Catholic church. So he's bribing them. I said, okay, uh, maybe they'll t change their attitude later on. I still remember the, this when I went down to Old Saybrook, and that was a, uh, a nice Catholic St. John's Church in Old Saybrook. And we had the uh, 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 rehearsal the night before. So I drove from Bloomfield to Old Saybrook. So after our rehearsal, everybody's going for the, rehears for the rehearsal dinner. I'm starving. They walk right by me, and I go across the street and get a hot dog. Okay, I got a call, so I think I'll take it before I get in trouble. You're on the air with Father Ed. Father, I just wanted to talk to you uh, about uh, your thoughts on uh, gun control. Uh, my, I, I feel gun control is a matter of uh, parent control. You know, uh, like I told about the 15-year-old kid who had a, a gun and they caught him at the middle of the night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, and the parents came up and said to them, um, oh, son, I love you. And uh, the prosecutor said, oh, why was he out on the street at 3 o'clock in the morning if you love your son? So gun control and family control, I think, go together. Well, what's your, your opinion on, on gun control? Well, I, I agree. I think that um, a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, a moral center. And I do believe that uh, people on both sides of the gun argument are, are correct. I believe that, uh, on the one hand, uh, there are way too many guns in this country in, in the hands of people. We've got more guns than, than people in our country. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, violent crime is not committed by guns. It's committed by people. Um, so really, um, uh, I'm a little more pragmatic about it, and I think that the approach should be um, an a approach of regulating the industry versus um, uh, going to the polar opposites. In other words, uh, banning guns or banning assault rifles, I don't think are the solution. It's, it's, it's banning violence, and, and that's something, again, like you said, it, it's, it's taught at home. Um, it's taught in the environments. Um, when, when there's a, a godless society or society that uh, promotes violence uh, over good, um, the, the gun is just a vehicle by which um, a crime is committed. Um, but I do think uh, a pragmatic solution could be simply regulation, like we regulate automobiles. Um, I mean, you need to register your automobile, which, which incidentally, Father, is, is a lethal weapon. You know, um, in the hands of a madman, an automobile could kill people, and, and it often it often does. If you read headlines, uh, um, a gun is the same way. It should be a regulated uh, endeavor, um, and and you currently could buy a gun at Walmart um, and ammunition, which is unfathomable in any other country. Uh, you know, uh, that that makes the, the the access is an issue, and the access to weapons of mass destruction, uh, you know, automatic uh, magazines and so on, um, in the hands of people that are out uh, seeking to do harm, um, it's a bad combination. I heard my uh, rebuttal. Go ahead. Uh, I, I got a, not a rebuttal, but a, a question to you. I've got a, a, there's a friend of mine from East Berlin, uh, Kathy Puglisi, who's very, very sick, and her brother called me. <laughs> <laughs> you had to have a family member before you can go in. So, so I went to see, uh, see her, and I met him. He was, he's a prosecutor. We start talking about gun control. And he says, over tw my 20 years, most of the ones that I, uh, guns that I uh, ended up in court were uh, stolen or uh, of uh, black market, and uh, most of them. So what, what do we do about the other source of uh, guns that are never registered? How do we handle that? Well, again, if you look at uh, uh, making the automobile analogy, if you look at how we handle it currently, there are people that drive on the roads with no insurance. Um, and how do we handle that? Your, your own insurance policy picks up what they call underinsured. Uh, so if, if somebody hits you and he has no insurance, your own insurance policy steps in their place as the responsible party and pays from your insurance policy. So there's a component of your auto insurance that you pay 
that covers you in the event that there's somebody driving with no insurance. And the same would apply to firearms. If I register my um, firearm and um, I use it for lawful purposes, but the other guy uses it, a stolen one, to go out and kill somebody, then everybody's underinsured coverage would cover that crime. So there would be a, effectively a victim's compensation fund that would come through the registration of firearms. And that would be all of them, whether it's for hunting, whether it's for personal protection, or whether somebody feels the need to own a bazooka or an AK-47 or whatever else they want. Um, like right now, if you go to register a Hyundai, you pay one price. If you go to register a Ferrari, you pay another price. And, and the Ferrari is more expensive to insure because of the propensity for it to go fast and get involved in a dangerous accident, for example. Um, whereas the Hyundai would be uh, cheaper to insure because it, it can't go that fast. You know, so it's the same thing with firearms. The analogies are, are the, 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 the template for, for automobiles could easily be um, uh, superimposed with firearms, and, um, and it would be a reasonable way to handle crime. Um, and again, as, as far as is it going to stop mass shootings? Probably not. Um, but it will end up having a component that will help pay for the victims. If I use a registered uh, firearm in the commission of a crime, uh, or if I know that if my firearm is not secured and, and a crime occurs from it, I will be held legally responsible for it. That's a big deal. Right. You're going to see you're going to see more people locking their firearms, keeping them out of their nightstands. Um, but there's also technology, by the way, that can do what they call smart firearms, where just like my cell phone won't work unless it has my fingerprint on it. Uh, you could ha um, have the gun makers pr uh, utilize that technology so that my gun will only work with me. Oh, okay, that's a good idea. And, and that's something that is, it's not science fiction. This is being used on everybody's cell phone right now. If, if somebody steals your phone, Father, um, you will be able to locate your phone, first of all, and nobody else, it'll, it'll be rendered completely useless to somebody who gets it. Because that particular cell phone, the ESIN number, the serial number, is all registered to you only. I see. Uh -huh. So the same thing could be done with guns. Again, this is, we're not asking for anything that is, uh, you know, it's, it, it, this is all technology that is currently in existence. Um, and again, whether somebody wants to do something bad, they could get behind the wheel of a car and do something bad. They could throw a rock. They could kill somebody. Look at the U.K. The U.K. has uh, all guns are outlawed, and if you read the, the local sections of the newspaper, uh, people are killing each other with knives, with stones, with baseball bats. Mm. <laughs> Crimes still occur. They just mm. don't happen with automatic weapons. Here's a, here's a question I have, and I don't have an answer. Maybe give me an insight. Uh, the tremendous increase of uh, mass killings, and uh, I guess over the years, I saw numbers over 7,000 or so, if it's over th two or three kids. Uh, why the increase of ma We've always had mass killings, but, you know, I'm afraid to go to Walmart right now. Uh, they got whacked twice. Uh, what, why, in your opinion, is there such a growth of uh, mass killings now? If, if you look at a lot of the statistics, the majority, and it's like 93 percent of, of gun crime is committed by males. Um, so they're not, you know, we're talking about men are committing these crimes with guns. Um, the, uh, again, the prevalence of the automatic weapons, the semi-automatic weapons, which um, make a carnage possible. Um, and, and as far as mental health issues with people, it's a huge issue. Um, and that, we've always had these issues. We just haven't had the, the means to execute these types of crimes. There's a lot of media sensationalism that goes in with it. There's a lot of certain, certainly psychological issues with a lot of these folks that, you know, feel the need to, to you know, to cause these heinous crimes. Um, but if you look at the last 20 years, uh, especially school shootings, um, we're the only country in the modern world that has this level of mass shootings and school shootings. Um, and there's a variety of factors behind it. They're predominantly male. Um, shooters, and and a lot of it points to broken households. It points to um, again a godless society. When you look at at the end of the 
at the end of the chain, whether or not it's a gun in their hands, if there's another means of, uh, look at Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh um, uh, killed people with fertilizer. Mm. Um, in the federal building there, he killed, he, he demolished it with fertilizer. You know, mm. so it's not a, a question of, uh, if there's a will to do harm, there's, there's always going to be a means in order to do it. Uh, do you think there's any connection between the rise of uh, drug uh, participation by our people now more than ever before. Would you think that would be any inf any occasion for somebody to get the so-called nerve to go out there and start killing people? What ends up happening is that the advent of the Internet has made access to uh, the rhetoric available to anybody. So, so if I want to be a uh, white supremacist, I get online and I can find thousands hundreds of thousands of other people that feel that way. If I want to be, um, if, I, if I decide I'm no longer, um, uh, I, I'm no longer feeling like I'm male, but I'm going to become female. There are thousands of people out there that I can relate to and connect with. Um, if, I, if I feel like I want to worship uh, mountain goats, there are, I will find people out there that worship mountain goats. Uh, so the advent of the internet has made the access of the information so readily available to people. So it, it's a cesspool for um, a lot of bad stuff. And, and again, if I'm angry and, and I'm a loner or I have, a, again, a, a very broken family or I, I'm angry over whatever is going on in my life, I can get online and find a, a place to commiserate with someone. Wait, what? And becomes the, the, the weapon of choice. Okay. What about the... Uh... Uh, the influence of uh, drugs on uh, uh, massive uh, uh, killings. You think there's a connection there? You mean, you mean the, the, the shooters? Yeah. Well, um, if you look at the shooters, they all have some, whether it's pharmaceutical or illicit drugs, there's, there's all, almost every single one's got an issue. Uh -huh. Even the Newtown shooter there, he was on about 16 different medications. Uh, the fellow in, New in Newtown that, oh, yeah. that shot those uh, poor children, um, he was on a, a lot of psychotropic drugs because of uh, mental health issues that he had. Um, so whether it's the pharmaceutical industry that was concocting this or whether or not it was just his treatment, um, obviously something fell through the cracks. You know, to have his mother enable him by allowing him to build an arsenal in a residential neighborhood in Newtown is unthinkable. But the easy access to these weapons is is a, 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 the flip side of it. Um, should anybody be allowed? Uh, if I can't go to an automobile dealership and purchase a car with money. I can't, Father. Yeah. I've got to go to the dealership. I've got to produce a driver's license. I have to produce proof of insurance. And then yeah. they will register my vehicle for me, no matter how much money I show up at that dealership with. I cannot yeah. legally drive it off the lot unless it's registered and has a license on it right. and has insurance. So why should I be able to go into a gun store and buy a semi-automatic rifle with nothing, with money? Yeah. I can go to a gun show with money in my hands, and they don't care if they're selling it to a crazy man. Yeah. And sometimes they do. So if everybody did that with a car dealership, then you would have people that were, um, again, were driving with no licenses, people that don't know how to drive, people that decided one day I'm getting a car and I'm going to get a car and see what happens. And innocent people would get killed. Yeah. It's, it's, mm. it's that simple. This is an area that requires regulation. So in summation... That regulation has yeah. to take into account um, uh, the capacity um, by which the user will be using the device. If I go into an automobile dealership and, and, and say, listen, I'm buying um, a, a Maserati because I want to go really fast and drive 100 miles an hour in a 25 zone, again, it would be the dealer's choice at that point. If I have a license and, and I have a record that's clean, I could buy the, the vehicle. But if I got a history of arrest warrants mm -hmm. because of the way I drive, they're not going to sell me the car. Yeah. You know? So there's a good a connection. So if I made you the president of the United States, what would you do? What would I 
do. I would require, you know, a, a, a gun registry. I would require a, a gun registration that requires liability insurance based upon the weapons that you own. And again, if I own a handgun, I would probably pay $50 a year in insurance. If I own an AK-57 uh, or whatever it is, an automatic weapon, it'd probably cost me $5,000 a year to own it in insurance. And that would be the choice that I would make as a, as a consumer in a free society. I'm not saying deny people the access to the weapon. I'm saying make sure that the weapon is ending up in the right hands by the responsible user. Oh, okay. If you feel the need to own it, they want to own a Ferrari, let them own a Ferrari. If they can't afford the insurance on a Ferrari, then they're going to have to go with something else. Well, that's a good comparison. I appreciate your, your insights. So I, I won't go out and buy a gun. I'll make sure I got insurance before I do. <laughs> go out and buy as many guns as you'd like, Father. Just make sure that you're insured and make sure that you're a responsible gun user. Okay. That's all. Uh, you know, and, 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 and as you always do, Father, you preach love, you don't preach hate, yeah. and, uh, and love always wins. You know that. Yeah, right. Good. Well, thanks a lot for your insight, and I hope to Thank hear you, Father. Thanks for calling. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was an interesting ca caller on uh, uh, the use of guns. And my uh, summation is uh, I look to the family. Uh, he looks to the insurance. That's a good point. Make sure everyone who has a gun has an insurance uh, policy. And don't give him a gun until he has insurance, just like don't give him a car until he has insurance. That's a nice, nice co uh, connection. And if you just tuned in, I'm Father Edna Donnelly from the Father Edna Donnelly Good News Fund. And we've been talking about a lot of things. We've been talking about marriage. We've been talking about birth control. We've been talking about guns. We've been talking about uh, 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 headlines in the paper. The four people got killed in a, in a car accident yesterday uh, for Epstein, who so-called committed suicide. Uh, and there was nobody was watching him. So you, uh, you turn around, and you can't help uh, asking yourself, uh, What's the good news? And the good news is God loves you. And God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in that person. So if you uh, have a question, I, I see the phones are ringing, so let's see. You're on the air of Father Ed. Hello, Father. Nancy. Nancy. Uh, good. I'm glad you called back. Would you explain to me about the connection of uh, birth control and the effect on your husband and the children and uh, et cetera. Could you uh, explain that to me? The information I got, you can Google Vicky, V-I-K-I, T-H-O-R-N on the Internet. Yeah, okay. And up comes biology of the theology of the body. Okay. That's where I got the information. Okay. Vicky Thorne, biology of the theology of the body. We have pheromones. They're located in our nose. It indicates the scent. And believe it or not, there's a physical, chemical desire uh, when people are courting to decide who to date. It has these hormones play a part. And if you are natural, you're not on the pill, you look for a complement, which means that your immune systems are also a complement. So that uh, you don't just marry somebody because of the, they have uh, a good uh, complement in terms of immune system, but just start there. If a woman is on the pill, her body is tricked into believing that she is pregnant, so she doesn't look for a complement. What she looks for is someone to protect her like a, a, a father or a brother. And usually the immune system of such a person with whom she might marry uh, is similar to hers. It may be one of the reasons we now have so many allergies uh, because a lot of women were on the pill when they met the person who became the father of her children. The other problem chemically is when she goes off the pill, she's not interested in the man she was interested in when she was uh, taking the pill 
because now her fur arms have gone back to normal. And now she's interested in a man whom she should have been interested in in the first place, in a natural way. Someone who's a compliment to her and who is also has an immune system that complements hers. So why she's uh, uh, on the pill, she feels as if she's pregnant. And what's her relationship with her husband then? Well, the, um, she, well, it, it's her husband or boyfriend or whoever is if she is attracted to this person while she's on the pill. She's looking for a protector because her body is fooled into thinking she's pregnant. Okay. And, and, and in this case, very often the immune system of the, the man to whom she's attracted is similar to hers, which affects children, uh, in that uh, it's better to have a complementary immune system in the one whom you are interested in uh, courtship, or I would prefer marriage. What about the immune system of children? Because well, it means that theirs is, uh, well, we know there are a lot of peanut allergies. There are a lot of all kinds of allergies now, lactose allergies. Some of these are because our foods have changed. But some of them may be to the fact that we have many, many couples now who became um, uh, related to one another and who had children while the woman was first on the pill and her immune system and the man she's interested in are very similar and that doesn't give the protection that a child needs. Even ancient peoples knew this. They would go from one village to another to find a husband or a wife for um, you know, a person in their clan because they just knew naturally that this made for a stronger physical child. Okay, so uh, what would be the main reason why should people should not uh, stay on the pill? Well, it's uh, all kinds of other reasons why. Uh, some of them are uh, that uh, you have a, a greater chance of getting breast cancer in your 40s, especially if you go on the pill uh, before you're 18. And some, you know, some girls go on not to be sex reactive, but to take care of, uh, you know, problems with acne and that sort of thing. And we're just finding it out now that this isn't such a good idea. But my suggestion is to go to the person I receive the information from firsthand, Vicki, V-I-K-I or V-I-C-K-I, Thorn, capital T-H-O-R-N, and listen, she has two uh, talks that she gave at colleges, and it's the biology of the theology of the body. It turns out, when, when, even when we didn't know it, the wisdom of the truth, the wisdom of God the Father to us in the Ten Commandments was for our benefit. Mm -hmm. And when you watch the video, you learn a lot of information. Good. Okay. Thanks a lot for calling in and giving your in insights. Um, okay. Goodbye now, Father. God bless you. We'll be in touch. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. That was interesting, and we're down to one minute. So I ask you to uh, give me your time. If you'd like to talk to me after the show, call me on my cell phone, 860-335-2342. 860-335-2342. The last call is a very interesting on gun control and on birth control. God bless you, and uh, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 860-335-2342. God bless you, and I hope to see you soon. Take care, and good night. <laughs>